start the recorder. All right, so we got our recorder going. And to you, I'm just excited to be in God's place with you on tonight once again. So just really excited what God is doing, you know. Wow. So um, let's see. We have began a journey, a long-awaited journey in the book of Revelation. And let me help some of some people out because. Let me show you how to pronounce the book of Revelation correctly since we got everybody here. When you hear somebody say the book of Revelations, plural, that's incorrect. It's pronounced the book of Revelation, not Revelations. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to get that out there uh, because the original Greek word for revelation is the word apocalypse. And the word apocalypse is two words. Apo means to uncover and calypse means to reveal. So it's more or less taking off the cover or revealing the end time events regarding the closure of, I guess you would call it of life to begin a life of eternity with Christ. And it's only up to the believer or the unbeliever to make that choice. As, as, as I say again, you have two options to face Jesus as these two animals, one as the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, or you can face him as, as the lion out of the tribe of Judah. And you have two occupations. In the judici judicial system that you would have to um, see him at your choice or your discretion. You could either have him as your attorney or judge. It's up to you. And that's what this is, the closure of God's events as. If you notice, the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation are pretty much one and the same. If you notice, the book of Genesis shows the beginning of everything. Well, the book of Revelation shows the ending of everything, and you know everything in between has its course. But again, on tonight, um, God has been blessing us, learning within this book that most people are afraid of, and you don't need to be afraid of anything, because when we find out all the events that you've been reading about in chapter 6 and to all, all the way out to the end of the book. Um, you won't even be here for any of that. So why are you scared and you're not even going to be here? There's nothing to be afraid of. You know, many people are afraid now of many things that are going on in the world. But the Christian, I'm trying to show the Christian, you don't have to fear anything but God. But people are walking around here fearing what's going on in the world more than they fear God, which is quite amazing, right? I mean, you only supposed to submit and fear the Lord Jesus Christ. Not what you see on TV, not him, not her, not them, this or that. No need for any of that, okay? So let us take a peek at our lesson. And yes, we have some still coming on in. All right, so as you know, we've been dealing with a study in the book of Revelation. For those of you coming in, we're just doing our little brief introduction before we deal with chapter two, starting at the eighth verse, which is the church of Smyrna tonight. Last week, we went over the church of Ephesus, which was the first church, which is the apostolic church, but we're going to find out what's going on with the second church in line. So, as you know, we are doing a study on the book of Revelations and Revelation. Now, always be mindful that whenever we do a lesson, there's always a theme verse attached to it. And that theme verse is really to help you break down the proper interpretation of the book of Revelation. So, when we look at this book of Revelation, um, to properly understand and interpret this book, God blessed us with one verse to understand how this book works. So you don't have to figure out 
any shortcuts or any try to the back doors or alleys is very simple. It's one verse that breaks this entire book down. And that's what we're going to look at real briefly before we get to chapter two tonight. Now, so we chose chapter one, verse 19. And this is the passage that lets us know that John was given a vision on the island of Patmos. And the island of Patmos is a very unique island because it was off the coast, not too far from Ephesus. And when we check this thing out, very interestingly, that he was in prison on the island of Patmos, not for stealing anything, not for murdering anybody, but for standing up for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? This man was arrested and jailed for preaching the gospel. Now, in other countries today, you can be persecuted or killed even today for your faith. Well, it's kind of interesting. We live in a country where we have the freedom of religion. But guess what? That is under close surveillance, and the CDC has that under a chokehold and a headlock. But it's interesting, you can go everywhere else where many people are located, but the church is restricted. Very interesting. So when we look at chapter one, verse 19, when John was told to write down what you have seen, very quickly, that's everything in chapter one. So if you were to look at these three sections of this verse, you pretty much could put a number one on top of that part where it says, write down what you've seen. Well, what did you see, John? You've seen everything in chapter one. John saw Jesus in a state he's never seen him in before. Be mindful that John seen him when Jesus chose him. John saw Jesus during his ministry and journeys, healings. He also saw Jesus in Matthew 17 when he was glorified at the Mount Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. He also saw Jesus when he was crucified. Then he also saw Jesus when he was resurrected. But this time in chapter one, this is a vision that John never seen Jesus before. He saw him in a whole different outlook. He saw him with his eyes were like a flame of fire. He saw him with his hair as white as wool. Uh, he saw him with his feet was the color of bronze. You remember the color of bronze is of judgment. So he saw John in a whole different shape, form, and fashion. But Jesus gave him seven letters to seven churches located over in Asia Minor. So to sum that up, when it says, write down what you've seen, John, that's everything in chapter one. Now, you notice the next section, section says, both the things that are now happening. Well, what is happening now? Well, this is the events in chapter two and chapter three. Why is that? Because this is where you find the seven churches to the seven letters of the seven candlesticks and the seven candle lampstand that Jesus was telling John about in chapter one. And you guys remember the number seven. So you see all these sevens associated in this book. So if you look closely, everything that is things happening right now, well, we are living in the church age. Well, we haven't just started living in the church age. We've been in the church age ever since Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit came back as a mighty rushing wind that is when the birthday of the church and the church existence came into play. Just like we learned last week that the church of Ephesus or Ephesians got started around about 33 AD. That was like right after Jesus was crucified, okay? But everything that's happening now, well, what's happening now? Well, as I told you, we're living in the church age, but again, when God looks from heaven, he looks at the church in three ways. When he looks down 
on the whole entire earth, the global body of Christ, the bride of Christ, he looks down on the church globally. And the reason when he looks down globally at the entire church is because no matter where any child of God is, Australia, Egypt, uh, Pennsylvania, Asia, Russia, we all are one body, doesn't matter where you're located. So when God looks down, the global church may act like one of the seven. See, now we're getting down to the seven letters, the seven characteristics, the seven dispensations. So when God looks down, these churches globally can act like one of the seven. So that's why we went over the first one last week, but tonight we're going over the second one. So not only does God look down at the whole body of Christ globally, well, he looks down at the churches locally, meaning the local church where you go and worship may act like one of the seven. See how we went from one collective body acting like the seven to the local church where you go acting like the seven, and last but not least. So we got globally, locally, and personally, you. You might act like one of these seven. And that's what this lessons in chapters two and chapter three is primarily breaking down each church so you can see how we act like some of these, our local church where we go act like some of the seven, and the whole body of Christ uniform unity acts like one of the seven so hopefully you guys got that so even though when it says both the things that are now happening that means we are living in these seven letters but these churches used to exist literally but they're no longer exist okay now as for chapters three and chapter four i mean chapter four and chapter five you notice these are the chapters that primarily deal with John being raptured up into another vision. Keep in mind, he's in a vision with Christ in chapter one of Revelation. But what happens is in chapters four and five, he's taken up a little higher to the throne room where Jesus is, and that's where they're going to loosen the seven seals. Okay, so you got that for both the things that are now happening is pretty much chapters two and chapter three, but chapter four and chapter five takes on a heavenly scene with John going up a little higher. Now, when it says, and the things that will happen, you notice the word will there. In other words, these things have not happened yet. This is chapter six all the way out to chapter 22. And you know what you can do then for that section? You could put chapter six all the way out to 22. So now when you look at this one verse, we have broken the whole book down for you, for proper interpretation. How about that? Y'all got that? Now, I'm going to do something real quick. For those of you who have Zoom, I'm going to share my screen with you real quick because I never got a chance to show you something. You know, when we talk about these seven churches, a lot of people think these seven churches are located in Israel. They're actually not. Um, can you guys see this handout that I just showed you real quick? What's yes. happening yes. is good. What's happening is this is the seven churches of Revelation. Now, you see where my mouse is circling right here? This is the capital of Israel where Jerusalem is, right? So you see where Jerusalem, the, the region of Judea, Caesarea, Tri, Sidon, Damascus. Remember when Paul was on the road to Damascus? All of that is located, you see? I wanted to show you this so you can really see these churches are located 600 miles way over here. You see that? So here's Jerusalem, Israel. 600 miles away, you have the seven churches. You remember I told you last week that even though we're talking about seven churches, 
the seven churches form a number seven. Isn't that interesting? So when you look at the little red dots, you notice it's a actual seven. I'm tracing it, starting with Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So you guys see that seven as I'm tracing the number seven? So isn't that something that we're talking about seven churches and it actually forms a number seven in their location or region? Isn't mm -hmm. that something? So when we talk about the approximate distance, Jerusalem to the seven churches, well, it's about 600 miles away. The most important thing to note from this map is that the seven churches of Revelation. These seven churches are not in Israel. That's something good to know because a lot of people think when we're talking about these seven churches, John, you know, on the island of Patmos, well, here's the island of Patmos right here. See, remember I told you it was not too far from off the coast of uh, Ephesus. So you see, this is the island of Patmos right here. So this fact indicates that the book of Revelation was probably written after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That was when the temple was destroyed, okay? The seven churches were located in what is known as Asia Minor, a Roman province. This name should not be confused with the continent of Asia, okay? Today, we know the location of these seven churches as being in the Aegean region of Western Turkey. These places provided a relatively safe haven for the early Christians and were Roman cities. While reference is always made to the seven churches of Revelation by name, the actual churches referred to were places of worship rather than actual church buildings, okay? Now, the significance of their physical location is not so much where they were located, but where they were not located, okay? These churches were not in the land of Israel, nor were they associated with the 12 tribes of Israel. Although they were certainly Jewish Christians who were members, this fact is important because at that time of the writing of the book of Revelation, the city of Jerusalem had been wiped out. The temple was destroyed. Israel is no longer reckoned among the nations and the Jews are or were being scattered to the four corners of the earth. Just how many years have passed since this catastrophic event and the writing of the book of Revelation is open to speculation and debate, but it is certain that it is afterward or was afterward this is important because we can conclude that at this time, this writing, God is not dealing with the nation of Israel anymore, but he's dealing with the church. Okay, I need to stress that because God is going to deal with the nation of Israel at the second coming. See, the first coming was to give us salvation. And if the Jews would have received Jesus, where that would have put the Gentile? Where would we be? But God blinded them so they couldn't see what was going on. So that opened up the door for me and you and the world, right? So that's what that's about. You see, for over 40 years, from approximately 30 AD to 70 AD, God is dealing with both the nation of Israel and his church. But now, at the writing of this book and continuing up until 1948 and the rebirth of Israel as a nation, yes, May 5th, 1948, that is when Israel became a nation and other countries got angry at that. God is dealing solely and exclusively with his people in the church. These seven churches do not have property lines which extend into the land of Israel. No, because they're very far away. His church, the mystery church, is not unique to Israel, but is now comprised of both Jews and Gentiles. You got that? 
Good. Just wanted to share that with you guys real quick. Now, okay, let someone in. Okay, so let's go into a little discussion about this Church of Smyrna tonight. Because as you know, last week we dealt with, what was the name of the church we dealt with last week? Ephesus. Okay, Ephesus or Ephesians. So Ephesus, all right. Ephesus, Ephesians, either one. Okay. Now, we know that this church, now I'm going to tag each church. So if you want to write this down, so you'll know the difference. The church of Ephesus was the apostolic church. It existed from 33 AD to 100 AD. Tonight, we're dealing with the church of Smyrna. What church is this one? This is the persecuted church. In other words, there was some persecution going on over here at this church. And this church existed from 100 AD to 312 AD. You see how 33 AD to 100, and this one picks up from 100 to 312. Well, next week, we're going to be dealing with a church that's starting at 312. We're not going into that one right now. We're not going into that right now. Okay. Oh, let me let them. Okay. So we're dealing with the church of Smyrna tonight. And last week was the church of Ephesus. And remember, there were four categories to address these churches, right? Each one of them. And we remember last week, the church of Ephesus, their commendation was they had good works, they had good labor, and they were patient. That was their commendation. Now, their condemnation, condemnation, meaning this was the problem that Jesus had with the church of Ephesus. It says that you left your first love, okay? Then their counsel was, remember from where you are fallen and repent, meaning to get up. That's the words he had for counsel for the church of Ephesus. And the challenge was, we'll give to eat of the tree of life. That was the challenge he gave the, fruit, the, the, uh, the church of Ephesus. So guess what? The church of Smyrna has four categories, the commendation, condemnation, counsel, and the challenge. And I'm going to come back to that. But let me give you a little something about this church, um, Smyrna. Well, the city of Smyrna was nicknamed the Port of Asia because it had an excellent harbor on the Aegean Sea. Remember, I just showed you the Aegean Sea. You see, the church in this city struggled against two hostile forces over there. They had a Jewish population strongly opposed to Christianity. Isn't that something? Let me say that again. They had two hostile forces at the Church of Smyrna. They had a Jewish population, strong Jewish population, but they opposed to Christianity and a non-Jewish population that was loyal to Rome and supported the emperor in worship. Oh, okay. What else going on over here? Well, the persecution and suffering were to be expected in an environment like this. You see, Smyrna, which is modern, modern Izmir, basically, which is located about off 30 mile, 35 miles north of Ephesus, it was an important port city and trade center that also boasted of schools of science and medicine. Oh, okay. Smyrna was also at the center for the imperial cult of emperor worship. Okay, sound like they into some other stuff over there. Look at this. So they had temples at Smyrna were dedicated to the emperor Tiberius, Zeus, and Sibeli. Oh, okay, so they got their worship with something else going on over here. You see, the gospel probably reached Smyrna at an early date, presumably from 
Ephesus or Ephesians, but that was talked about over in Acts chapter 19, verse 10, by the way. You see, the church at Smyrna suffered from poverty and persecution by the Jews. Oh, okay. Polycarp, one of the apostles of John's disciples. Yeah, you see, John had a, an apostle over there, by the way, served as bishop or the pastor of Smyrna and was martyred there around about 156 AD when he refused to renounce his faith. Oh my goodness. So they got rid of the pastor or the messenger or the angel of the church of Smyrna. In other words, um, poor Bishop um, Polycarp, um, he refused to renounce his faith. Well, let me pause right here to remind you something. What they did here at this church, this is going to happen when we get to Revelation chapter 13, by the way. You see, they're going to ask people to denounce their faith and renounce your faith to receive a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. I mean, I know I'm jumping all the way up. Uh, what was that? Somebody had a question? Okay. So what's happening is this pastor or angel or messenger at the church of Smyrna was martyred because he refused to renounce his faith. And guess what? He was burned alive on a wooden pry. That's like a type of pit. You see, but the thing is, that's going to happen eventually later on. But guess what? The church won't be here for that. So when people need to understand something really serious, what I'm going to say right now, that Jesus died for you right now, meaning you need to accept Jesus Christ right now as your personal Lord and Savior, meaning he died for you now. But guess what? After the rapture, after the church leaves, you got to die for him now. So that's the way this thing works. Either you can get ready to board the bus now and get ready, but if you trying to get ready, you go miss the bus. So you need to be ready. I just want to throw that in there because this man lost his life because they wanted him to denounce his faith. And guess what? When they get to chapter 13, I got a later announcement I'm gonna make about this chapter later on when I get to chapter 13. So the pastor here at Smyrna, let me tell you a little bit about this pastor here at the church of Smyrna. This pastor here was at Smyrna, he was a poor man and he had suffered greatly, but he continued in the labor and work in the faith against those who claimed to belong to God, you see, but they did not. Those who teach that genuine faith always brings earthly wealth should note that Jesus found no fault with this very poor man who was the pastor over here at um, the Church of Smyrna. See, we got a lot of these pastors today living very sumptuously, doing very good, but this pastor here suffered. And uh, I'm going to get to something in a hot second. See, this man didn't have it all, but he worked hard for what he had and they wanted to get him to denounce his faith, and he didn't do it. You see, earthly possessions, or the lack thereof, are absolutely unrelated to a person's spiritual death or cleanliness. You see, to judge a man's spiritual condition by his earthly circumstances is utter folly. You see, Jesus told this very good man that despite his earthly poverty, this pastor didn't have nothing but he was still preaching, understand? He was rich in heavenly treasure. You see, don't get caught up around here trying to get everything looking good and making sure everything tidy and right. This was a pastor who was poor at the church of Smyrna. Understand what's going on? That's why I wanted to dig in these churches because a lot of people don't get in the book of Revelation to understand each one of these seven pastors was going through something over here. But we got pastors out here doing very well got 401ks and got cars. Oh, they got it going on. But this pastor at Smyrna didn't have nothing, okay? This was a faithful dear pastor. 
He loved his church and Jesus warned him that his faith was about to be tried by having to see some of them cast into prison by Satan. Isn't that something? Satan locking people up who want to testify about Jesus. Same thing, sound like John, doesn't it? I had to hit that shoulder. Sound like somebody like John I know, huh? Doesn't it? But falsely claiming to be sent from God, certain ones at the church of Smyrna had unknowingly become, in Jesus' words, the synagogue of Satan. Oh, yeah. Some churches ain't nothing but a, a, a prancing palace for Satan to rip and run up in there. And then, you know, I mean, let me drop this on you real quick. Be careful when places, places are packed out. Now, I'm not talking about nothing COVID related. Be careful when places are packed out. Let me give you a very good example that the Bible tends to overlook. There was a man by the name of Mary and Joseph. They were trying to get in somewhere, but they couldn't get in because it was too full. But let me tell you something. When you're trying to get in somewhere and Jesus ain't in there, you need to turn and click your heels three times and get to stepping. Because how dare you say this is a place called an inn, but you ain't got no room for Jesus to get in there? Oh, Jesus said, don't worry about that, Joseph and Mary. Let's go on over here to this stable. I don't need nobody to be present when I'm born. I just need my creation to be born with me. The animals, how about that? The animals are the ones that's obeying me anyway, because all the animals that Noah had in the ark, yes, they went in seven pairs clean. And yes, it was male and female animals, right? I don't see two male alligators. I don't see two female dogs. I don't see uh, two pigeons that's females. That's why God said, when I'm born, I want the animals here because they respect me and human beings don't. Let me leave y'all alone. I ain't got time for this because people don't understand if the animals obeying God, male and female, all us humans out here want to be Adam and Steve, Eva and, Eva and Gloria and all this stuff. God ain't got time for that. He already knew. I want my animals in the manger when I'm born because these humans don't respect me. Oh, let me leave y'all alone. I got somewhere to go. See, you don't know what you're missing when you're not in the church. This book should have been preached. This is the book of Revelation we in tonight. Go and preach it. But you don't hear this kind of preaching. Preach it. Preach it. Preach it. In the church. You've been in there 40 or 50 years. But this pastor was Pope. Maybe that's why we don't hear nothing because the pastors don't want to be checked when they Pope. Preaching that. Let me preach take Marvin. a step on that. You teaching it and teaching it. Preach. 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 I need this. I have to pull over. Yeah. Pull over. You're preaching. You're preaching. Oh, my God. My God. We just only at the church of Smyrna, by the way. We ain't got to like the mama. rest of them. We just right here. We ain't went nowhere yet. You see, this this touches me because Pastor Clark didn't have nothing. Speak on. He was burnt alive. This pastor was burnt. Come on now. Oh, Jesus. This pastor was burnt for the testimony of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Jesus. Jesus. Talking about they ain't got no room in the end. If Jesus ain't in there, you don't want to be in no room with him. My, my, my. Oh, my goodness. Let me leave y'all alone. My, my. You see, this church was labeled as the synagogue of Satan. And in the approaching persecution of the faithful saints at Smyrna, such false teachers would play a large part by claiming a divine revelation and ordination not actually received from God. Foolish men become more like Satan than they know it. Fit for nothing but to be used as a simple expendable pawn in the warfare game about which they are entirely ignorant you see the fact that satan was personally involved 
in the persecution of this church here is a testimony to the effectiveness of this pastor's ministry. For it indicates that the depth of their faith and love in Christ was sufficient to deal with. Jesus simply encouraged this good shepherd here to be faithful unto death. This pastor and the pastor at the Church of Philadelphia, you know what? I don't mean to skip around real quick, but there's only two churches out of the seven that God had good words for. And those two churches are only the Church of Smyrna and the Church of Philadelphia were the only two of these seven were told either to completely or plainly not to repent. These are the only two. You see, the city had become a center for the cult of imperial worship. Smyrna received permission over all several other cities who requested to build a temple emperor for the emperor Tiberius. Under the, um, under the emperor of uh, Domite, emperor worship was required for all Roman citizens, by the way. You see, those who refused could receive the death penalty. Oh, and you know what? It's coming one more time. Oh, don't you realize that we're in the book of Revelation that people are going to have to denounce their faith, just like this church did? It's coming. But guess what? If it's in chapter 13, I already told you everything from chapter 6 all the way to chapter 22, we won't be here for it. But we go read about it and learn about it so you can tell somebody else to get ready. Okay? So again, those who refuse to receive the death penalty here, once a year, look at this. All citizens were required to burn incense on the altar to Caesar, after which they would receive a certific uh, certificate proving that they had done all their civil duty. Kind of sound like something we knocking on the board a little bit today. Sound like they are trying to legalize and mandate some stuff around here. You see, while this was more an act of political loyalty than a religious act, the citizens had to say while burning the incense, guess what they had to say while the incense was burning? Caesar is Lord. That's what they had to say. Many Christians consider this act to be blasphemous and refuse to do it. In addition to being a center of imperial cult worship, the Church of Smyrna also had a large Jewish population that actively opposed the Christians. And I can't wait to get to chapter 13 because I'm going to tie a lot of this stuff in. What they're going to do, this is where they're headed. You see, there's a parable that goes with this church, but I told you I'm going to deal with all the parables to each church after I finish all of them. Okay? Now, real quick, let us look at verse 8 of chapter 2 real quick. Because now that I gave you a little introduction of this church, what was going on here with Pastor Polycarp over here, he got burned because he wanted to denounce, they wanted him to denounce his faith and he didn't do it. Oh yeah, this was the Pope pastor over here, but oh, we think um, being a pastor comes with certain lifestyles today. Oh no, 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 not this pastor over here. So this is the church of Smyrna. Let's see what's going on over here. It says, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, well, you guys know, whenever you hear somebody say, giving all praises to God and the angel of this house, they are basically letting us know the angel of a house is the pastor, bishop, um, the one who oversees that particular local congregation. So this is the same thing here. So we know the angel of the church of Smyrna is Pastor Polycarp here, okay? So it says, and to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Oh my goodness, what is that talking about? Well, ancient Smyrna is today the modern port and manufacturing city of Uzmer over in Turkey. You see this particular anciently named for its trade and its um, anesthetic embalming herb and myrrh. Oh, so this is the particular port in the church location where they had anesthetics, 
embalmings and myrrh. Well, this is a perfect time to let us know that out of the three gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus, remember they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, gold represents kingship. Frankincense was the incense that you would burn in the temple, and the incense smoke represented the odors of the prayer. Oh, well, why would they bring myrrh to a baby shower? Oh, how does that look if you have a baby shower and somebody is bringing you some goods from Wilson and Crassie to your baby shower, to basically to embalm your baby? Well, myrrh was an ointment used on the body before you wrap it for burial. Oh, so you mean to tell me that the wise men knew to bring myrrh, myrrh to a baby. You know what this is symbolically saying? This is the persecuted church. This is the church that's gonna be suffering unto death. So that's why you they brought myrrh to baby Jesus because they already knew he was coming to die. And that's a word for us today. You see, the word Smyrna is part of Myr. Smyr. I don't know if y'all got it yet. Smyr. Smyrna. Smyr. Myr. No. Okay, I think y'all got it. So this is the church that was going to be the persecuted church because they will have to be faithful unto death. So this is interesting that they deal with anesthetics, embalming fluids, herbs and myrrh there, known as a political center for Asia Minor. It took its obligation to Caesar's worship seriously, especially when Polycarp, the bishop, the angel of Smyrna, was martyred by burning in 155 when he didn't plead his own dying. He didn't even want to save his own life by denouncing Christ. You know what? Polycarp responded, 80 and six years have I served him, and he never did me wrong. Oh, my goodness. This is something. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? You're probably wondering, where did I get that? What did Polycarp say? That's in a whole nother lost book. But I got some stuff for you. But it's good to see what Pastor Polycarp said on his way out. He said, for 86 years, I've served Jesus and he never did me wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? It is reported that the city's Jews were so anxious to see Polycarp dead that they violated their own Sabbath to haul off, they call this word faggots, the wood. That's what they call wood. They, in other words, they went to go get the wood for the fire like the Lord Jesus, Polycarp witnessed a good confession of how the Lord's people live and die. You see, he, be, he became a part of it. You see, the Lord portrays himself, I like this, as the first and the last, which was dead and now he's alive. Because of Smyrna's special need for grace and persecution, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We need to take on that same uh, sentiments. We don't need to fear what man go do unto us. We need to be faithful unto our Lord, okay? Suffering and persecution are God's appointed tools to sanctify his people. Only if you knew the blessings of suffering and persecution, because that's how you get patience, my friend. A lot of people want patience. Well, guess what? You got to go through some trouble to get it. As I told you the word through, if you look at it carefully, remove the letter T and the H and you got rough in the word through. So when you're going through something, it's going to be rough. Just wanted to throw that in there for you. So when it became for him, for whom all things are, and by whom all things, in bringing many souls and sons unto the glory to make the captain of their savior. That's the good thing. Woo How can our sanctification and growth and grace be any less than that of a sinless son of a son of man. See, that's the beautiful thing. So Polycarp stood bold, being faithful unto death. Okay, look at verse nine. We only got a couple of verses tonight in the church of Smyrna. 
Verse 9 says, I know your tribulation. Woo. That's that, that's that suffering word there. I know your tribulation and your poverty, pastor. But guess what? You are rich in the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. Woo-wee. Only if you guys knew there are some Jews in upper tier government who claim they Jews, and this goes right with them too, and they're not. Woo. But are a synagogue of Satan. Look at that. The Lord's omniscience says, again, I know your works, but should be of great comfort to the saints. Your father knoweth what things you have me before you even ask. You see, the suffering Smyrna benefits from the raft of Satan because all things work together for the good to them that love God. That's Romans 8, 28. Now, persecuted Smyrna becomes sanctified Smyrna. Let me repeat that. Persecuted Smyrna becomes sanctified Smyrna because God's people learn more about the Lord Jesus, riches and glory. You see, when we are motivated by tribulation, sanctified through the sufferings of Smyrna, they were yet rich. You see, the Greek word pototia is translated poverty. Oh, what are you talking about right here? Let me rewind that. The Greek word potatia is translated poverty, having nothing at all. You see, listen, my beloved brethren, have not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he have promised to them that love him? Oh, my goodness. That's a good word right there. You see, the apostle Paul instructed us concerning the characteristics of a true Jew. You see, over in Romans 2.29, it says, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. Oh, my goodness. In the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. I like that. Consequently, suffering Smyrna's Jewish persecutors who assisted in Polycarp's mar uh, martyr were of the synagogue of Satan. In other words, you got people at this church doing the work of Satan in there. Isn't that something? And we still got the same thing going on today. You see, hostility to Israel's rejected Messiah will finally turn against God's people. If the world hates you, Jesus said, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So if a lot of people might hate you and don't like you, don't worry about it. It's just the Christ in you they don't like. They might try to like you, but they really got a problem with the person inside of you, and that's none other than Jesus Christ. John 15 and 18 says, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, everybody. I have overcome the world. In other words, God already got this thing finished. And if you in him, you go cross the finish line, all right? Oh, guess what? We only got two verses real quick and we'll be done, you guys. Verse 10 says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Look, that word behold means look. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for 10 days, you will have tribulation. You guys remember the number 10? See, that's why I showed you all of these numbers because the book of Revelation is full of numbers. Y'all know the number 10 is the number of human responsibility. So he's letting them know you're gonna be responsible for yourself basically getting tested for 10 days. And you will have tribulation, but this is what he tells them. I need y'all to be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And I'm going to need to share with somebody tonight, be faithful unto death regardless, because Jesus got something for you. You see, it seems that every time the Lord speaks to us, he must tell us not to fear. You remember when Jesus appeared up to the disciples after he resurrected? First thing he said, fear not. See, we have to stop fearing around here, my people. 
especially if you're fearing over what you're watching on TV and what's going on in the world. Let me comfort you tonight. Please fear not. Have faith. Relax. That's why I can rejoice and relax because my faith has brought me somewhere. In other words, the songwriter says, he has brought me from a mighty long way. Yes, he has. Even in this little bitty life that's a vapor, James says, it says your life is like a little vapor. It appeared for a little while in advantage, but guess what? That little vapor had something in it called faith that let me stand through all my trials and tribulations through the test of time. And guess what? You can't have a testimony without a test. But a lot of us like to test a lie instead of testify. <laughs> so again, when it says, um, Jesus knew that they're gonna be persecuted. You see, prison in the time of the apostle John was normally to wait for trial or execution and not the punishment itself. You see, the, re the relationship to faith and to survival during the tribulation is gonna be very strict, that you're gonna need faith to get through any tribulation that you're going through right now. Because when the tribulation period get here, oh, faith is really non-existent then because you don't need it. If you get left here after the rapture, the Holy Spirit won't be here to help you, my friend. So that's why the Holy Spirit is here now to help you. You see, 10 days when it says, seems to be determined period of testing as it was with Daniel eating the king's meat. Remember, prove thy servants. I beseech thee 10 days. That word 10 came up in the, uh, the book of uh, Daniel, chapter 1 and verse 12. Remember, Daniel and had to deal with 10 days. See, our testing will not go on forever. You see, that's what this is about. Our Lord will never let us go beyond our capacity to keep us from sinning. You see, there's no temptation taking you but such as common to man, but God who is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're not able to deal with. There is no temptation that is common unto you, okay? So when you find yourself getting caught up, God is gonna provide you a way of escape. Whenever you get put in a situation, always look for the exit sign. You ever been in a room and the room may be dark, but then you notice there's a little glowing exit sign. See, when you know Jesus Christ, whatever situation I'm in, I don't have to worry about anything because I'm going to see the red blood stained banner of the exit sign when he, when I find myself in something, I can look to the blood stained banner of an exit sign to get me out of whatever situation I'm going in and dealing with, okay? When it says faithful unto death, that means that our Lord has sovereignly chosen some of us to be his martyrs. Now, I'm going to share something with you. Jesus did not come here for everybody. I'm just keep it real. You may say, how can you say that? Well, guess what? It's written in the scripture. Where is that found? Well, I'm glad you asked. Matthew 1 and 21 says, this is a faithful saying that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, but he was only coming to save his people. It didn't save the world. So you need to figure out, are you one of his or are you one of his? When I say one of his, small s, capital, I mean, I say small h, that's one of Satan's. See, because he got workers in the church too. Then if it's a capital H, that means you're one of his, Jesus. And that's why I got to keep reminding y'all, you either a saint or an ain't tonight. Let me, I'm going to say that again. You either one of God's saints or you one of God ain't. I know that's not proper English, but I'm keeping it real. You either an ain't or a saint, okay? I'm not talking about the New Orleans Saints either. Now that's that football. No, no, no. We ain't talking about that. I don't know what their record is and don't care. I got to say, I'm on a team that will always win. We won before the game even started. Okay? Now, though our reward is the Lord himself, he does not prefer gifts upon his overcomers. 
You see, the epistle of James discusses this same crown, but does not attach martyrdom as a qualification. You see, it says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Lovingly enduring trial and temptation, even unto death, seems to be the requirement for the crown of life. So if you want to suffer for Christ and reign with him then, it's all right, okay? And guess what? Last verse. Then we made it through our verses tonight. Last verse. Oh, well, this is an easy one. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You remember when Jesus taught every parable, he said, he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. But you notice in this text, when he's dealing with the seven churches, he says, he that is in here, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. And guess who's a part of the church? Me, you. Why? Because God looks down globally. He looks down locally. And then he looks down personally. So when he says he looks down and say, what, see, you see what the spirit says to the churches? This is talking about me, you. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the, whoa, the second death. Oh my goodness. You mean to tell me there's another death after you die? Oh, yes, it is. Woo we? Now, when it says, whosoever have ears, let him hear what, what the spirit is saying to the churches. This is letting us know that if you are part of the body of Christ, you are part of the spiritual building church, which is one of the spiritual bricks that make up the spiritual building, okay? So again, we are overcomers. Why? Because Jesus is in us and he's going to lead us to victory inside of us on our ship. And if your ship getting tossed and turned, well, guess what? Go wake the captain up downstairs and have him come up to say, peace be still to your situation, okay? We are given the blessed assurance, not insurance, but blessed assurance that God will not suffer the rules to change after we get to heaven and allow us to not taste the second death, okay? Blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection on such the second death have no power. Woo-wee, and guess what? Let me go ahead and um, give us the, um, the areas of the commendation real quick. The Smyrna church, remember I told you church of Ephesus is the apostolic, well, guess what? The church of Smyrna is the persecuted church, okay? And then when we say the commendation, well, what was the commendation that Jesus had for the church of Smyrna? Well, it was their works, their tribulation that they were going through, and their poverty. What was the condemnation? Well, in other words, what was the problem Jesus had with the church of Smyrna? And guess what? Not one word. He didn't have a problem with Smyrna. And I'm going to give you a hint. You already know what the other church didn't have a problem with. That was the church of Philadelphia. We're not yet there yet. As they say, are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. Now, the counsel that he had for Smyrna was to fear not. Be faithful. That's it. And what was the challenge he had for the church of Smyrna? Well, they will not be hurt by the second death. You see, when Jesus saved you, he saved you from God's wrath and eternal damnation, meaning once you are born twice, you don't die no more. And remember, I always talk about the two-in-one factor. When you are born once, you have to die twice. And if you're born twice, you only die once. When you born earthly, that's your earthly arrival. Then you become born again. The only earthly body died, but you don't die no more. But if you're not born again, you're born into this earth and you don't get the second birth. Well, you got two deaths because the physical body has to die to be placed into the casket or urn, whatever your choice. Then the second death has to be instituted, meaning you have to be, the soul has to be put to death. So now you see what it means by 
the two and one factor. It's your, there's a choice again. That's your choice. And now that I have everyone here, I'm gonna make a quick announcement regarding the, the chapter 13. See, right now we're on chapter two and we're on the second church, but I'm gonna stress this and I'm gonna keep saying it. I'm gonna do like a little marketing. If you can please get with someone, whether in their home or visit someone when we get to chapter 13, because I'm gonna do something that I've never done before. I'm gonna teach and show how chapter 13 is symbolic to everything on the back of the dollar bill. That way I'm gonna show you everything on the back of the dollar bill and it's gonna coincide hidden truths that you probably didn't even know while this dollar was sitting in your purse, wallet, pocket, inside pocket or whatever. The dollar bill has everything on the back of it. And we know the number 13 is the number rebellion. Well, there's a whole bunch of 13s on the back of that dollar bill. And I will say this, even if you don't get a chance to get the Zoom app or be online or anything, make sure you get a dollar bill that night and make sure you get a magnifying glass because you're gonna see something that you've never seen before. And you're gonna be shocked at what's been in your hand transferring purchases all of your life. Didn't even know that the whole plan to the new world order is sitting on the back of that dollar bill. And actually the mark is on the back too, by the way. So to God be the glory, we made it through the church of Smyrna. Does anyone know what the church next week we're dealing with? 